Hey, uh, good morning. Uh, I guess it's technically afternoon now. I'm Mark. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm excited. I'm sad that I have to follow Jean. I think she did a great talk. Uh, if, you, if you weren't here, you missed out. Um, hopefully you can watch it later. Uh, but today I want to talk about abstractions. Really what I want to do is rant about abstractions. We've talked about abstractions for basically this whole conference. There's been a lot of talks already about abstractions. Um, and now we're, there's going to be uh, N plus one talks about abstraction. So um, anyway, uh, for the last few years, I've been writing Erlang. Um, pretty much full time is my day job. And so this is sort of a story about my journey from Erlang land where, you know, super happy, Mark. And then I kind of went over into Scala land where Mark was not so happy anymore. Um, and so this is a talk about that, and you know, um, one of the things I learned from Star Trek V is that every man has a secret pain, and you grow stronger with the sharing of that pain. So let me share my pain with you. Uh, maybe it's a pain you can identify with, maybe not, I'm not sure, but um, in any case, if you don't line up and ask questions, I'm just telling you right now, uh, you're going to have to sit through a lot of cat pictures, so, so you know, let that be an encouragement to you. Um, so I am sort of an addict for uh, Vulcan self-help books. Uh, this is a bestseller. Uh, it's called Your Pain Runs Deep. Um, check it out. It's, it's fantastic. All right, so um, I mentioned abstraction at the top of the talk, um, you know, a couple minutes ago. Abstraction is really useful. It's what we do, I think, in a large part uh, as, as software developers. Um, we, you know, introduce abstractions to do a lot of things. We want to introduce levers into, you know, certain problems. We want to encapsulate things, right, so we abstract them. Um, and we want to take complexity away, right? We want to be able to reason about whatever our problem space is, our problem domain. And so we introduce all these abstractions into our code. Um, and that's that's fine and great and wonderful. And And certainly we need to continue to do that. I think that's very important. Um, but one of the things we need to be aware of is um, when we start uh, abstracting uh, the wrong things. And I'm going to get into what I think those wrong things are later in this talk, assuming that you don't ask me questions. Um, so uh, the other thing that's really interesting lately uh, that I've noticed, especially as, as I've gotten older and grayer, is um, that we have abstractions as a service now. Um, it used to just be that you had abstractions in your code base, but now we have abstractions everywhere. And um, like my sticker on the front of the computer says, um, there is no cloud. It's just someone else's computer, right? Like that's an abstraction of itself, OK? Um, but we have TensorFlow and services from Amazon and Azure and Google and you know, dollar sign random hosting provider, whatever. Uh, any sort of web API that you, that you consume or use or, or provide uh, out into the world, you, you've created an abstraction that you want other people to use. Um, and you need to think about, like, how do people use that? And is it a good abstraction? And does it really encapsulate the sort of things that we want to encapsulate? Um, but, you know, we still have the traditional model, which is this sort of on-premise abstraction, right? Uh, we have search, um, elastic, and solar sort of made search a lot more accessible, right? Um, there's the, the scare quote big data stuff, um, Spark and Hadoop and Apache project. Um, you know, you can put any random Apache project in there, and it, it will pretty much be big data, uh, scare quote. Um, and we also have this one. This is one of my favorites. Does anyone know what this is? Anyone? It's a data bass. Right? It's a data bass. So, yeah, I used to work at Basho, and um, we, we had this GIF uh, a lot in our hip chat. Um, so, um, yeah, so we have data bases, and, and we, we abstract away like storage, and we abstract away sort of storing data and retrieving data, right? We, we hide it behind this interface of SQL, and that's fantastic, um, and, 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 and desirable even, right? Like, we don't want to have to manage all the complexity of everything that we do all the time. Like, there's just too much cognitive load for that. Um, so the pitch is this, right? You don't really need to understand the messy details about the abstraction. Right? Like, the abstraction is supposed to hide all of that from you. It's supposed to contain it. It's supposed to protect you uh, from having to really think about how it works. So the system will account for all the things, right? Like, yay, all the things. Um, so just relax. Relax. Write your system, right? Just write it as you would. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Right? It'll be fine. I could have replaced this with what could possibly go wrong, right? Okay. Um, 
we all, we all know what could possibly go wrong. You, I'm sure you all have stories, um, just like I do. So if you do, the microphone's there. We're over the five minute threshold, by the way. Um, it'll be fine. It will be fine. It'll, it's even after this talk, it will still be fine. All right, so I mentioned earlier that I started working with Spark. Um, Spark is, is pretty amazing. Um, it, it has a lot of really interesting and great features to it. I'm gonna talk about a few of them in a, in a, in a second. Um, and one of the really neatest things is that it sort of promises that you can write an application to do big data uh, as if you know, you're writing for a single computer. You're writing for a giant, huge computer that's super happy and does a whole lot of things for you, like this stuff. Look at all this free stuff. Look at it all. You can program Spark in three different languages. You can program it in Python. You can program it in Scala. You can program it in R. I guess I'll throw in Java, so for free. So four languages. It automatically partitions work. It does job retries when the job fails. It automatically collates all the output from the worker nodes. It does job scheduling. It's pluggable. You can plug in your own scheduler. You can run it on thousands of nodes. Um, it even has a reasonably nice UI, right? It'll tell you like, hey, uh, we're on segment 69 of 3,492, um, and it'll even draw you a nice DAG with 3,492 edges, which is really completely incomprehensible. Uh, but it does it, right? So that's super cool. Um, and, and we like that. That's, that's nice, right? Um, but the main point of Spark is, is that the computer is your friend, right? The computer is your friend. That's what we always hear, the computer is your friend, but we all know that the computer is not your friend, right? The computer's not your friend, and I didn't come to praise distributed systems. I came to bury them, and I came to rant about them a little bit. But before that, I have an obligatory cat picture, um, because I have to, number one. But number two is uh, I'm staying in an Airbnb that's, that's nearby, and this cat actually lives in the flat where I'm staying, uh, and she's a very, very nice cat. Um, so I had to put it in, in the talk. Um, there's, a, there's a really interesting article uh, that was published about a month ago on Medium, um, and it talked about sort of the leaky abstractions that were in Windows Vista, right? It was a, 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 Microsoft, a senior Microsoft software developer who worked in Office for a long time, and he was writing about Spos, uh, Spolsky's law of software abstractions, which is this. All non-trivial abstractions, to some degree, are leaky, right? He, and Joel Spassky wrote that in 2002. So that sort of meme or thought has been floating around out there in the ether for a long time, for a super long time. Um, and I don't think that uh, anyone that I know who has been a software developer for a long time can really deny that this is true. I mean, if you, if you want to discuss that, I would be happy to take any questions. Um, but I think this is a really in interesting conclusion um, that's sort of not controversial in any way. Um, but one of the things that, that I've been thinking about really hard in the context of that is sort of what is the price that we pay for bad abstractions, right? Like, if they're all leaky to some degree or other, if they're non-trivial, and you can quibble about what does non-trivial mean? Like, think of an abstraction that you've written. What? What? Okay, FSAs. Is, it, is there more to that? Like, uh, yeah. My question is: Is leaky abstraction is really like synonymous to bad abstraction? Maybe leaky abstraction is not like bad abstraction. It's, uh, it's just yeah. can be. Uh, it can't abstract some details, uh, and then you shouldn't uh, use that use, use this abstraction in the cases where these details might matter or like don't matter. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, what do you say about that? <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, uh, that's, that's a, a great point. Um, I, I think, um, yeah, I, you're right. Uh, I guess what I was going to say or what I'm thinking right now in the, in, in the context of that question is um, that leaky doesn't necessarily mean bad. Like, I know that often we use it sort of uh, in a negative way. We use it to describe abstractions that are bad. Um, but if they're all not, if all non-trivial abstractions are leaky to some extent, right, whatever those words mean, um, then every, every abstraction that we create has leaks in it, right? We expose some of its internals somehow or other uh, for other people to consume. And sometimes that makes sense, and sometimes it doesn't make sense. Um, so I think that, uh, that it's 
a good distinction to draw between bad abstraction and just regular old leaky abstraction, which to me is just abstraction. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, another question? Go ahead. So here's a proposed way to define what it means to be a leaky abstraction. You have a specification which is short and understandable mm -hmm. and which doesn't completely describe the, the behavior of the software that has this abstraction. And then you have a slightly more complex sub, uh, specification that says, oh, in this particular case, it doesn't work like that. You have to mm -hmm. do this extra thing to fix it up. So when you have these two specifications, the simple one you want and the more complex one that is actually implemented, that's the leak. Yeah, good point. Um, I, I, I agree with that. I agree with that thought. Um, and, th and that's actually part of my journey on, on Spark, uh, for sure. Um, so uh, what, I, what I was thinking about, um, just, to, just to get back into the, the slides a little bit, uh, we're going to play uh, pub trivia for a second. Um, does anyone know who this person is? Any, any clues? All right, I've got a hint. I've got a hint slide. It's coming up. This is the last chance to get full points right now. Yeah, it's Arthur Clark. Arthur Clark wrote, here's my, here's my hint slide, right? Isn't, it, isn't that cool? Uh, it's, it's the monolith, like with Lego guys. I think this is super cool. Uh, like, it's always awesome what you find on the internet. Um, anyway, uh, the question is, like, what are we to do? Like, you know, what are we to do? What are we to do about leaky abstractions or bad abstractions? Um, and Arthur Clark wrote a story in the 50s called Superiority, and it's a short story, it's probably about 3,000 words. You know, you can read it in, in, f in five or seven minutes, probably. Um, and it's the story of a civilization that was engaged in a war for its existence with another civilization, another space civilization. And it talks about how this, the, 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 the first one, um, which had like technologically superior uh, military tactics and firearms and all sorts of things like that, ended up losing the war. And the story recounts, basically in graphic detail, this cascading failure of abstractions, right? Um, the, the, the sort of scientist uh, teams at, in, this, in, this civiliz in this notional civilization would go out and create brand new weapons that were super destructive, and uh, they required a whole bunch of other maintenance and engineering teams to actually keep them operational, which imposed further higher um, you know, uh, requirements on the military to protect them, and they couldn't do that successfully. And so what they ended up happening is they lost the war, right? They lost the war because they just kept building this um, increasingly large and technologically complex pile of uh, weapons that required uh, much more overhead and thought process into making them successful. Um, even though they were, they were amazingly successful um, th when they were working, right? But that was the problem, was they didn't always work. So, um, is, it, is, is the speaker thing counting up or counting down? It's counting up. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. So, so what are we, yeah, the question way in the back. I'm, I'm sorry to, to interrupt because the, the test talk is, um, well, you have an idea and you have to expose it. But um, you were talking about leaky abstraction, and I remember when we were using SQL, we were like ordering joints because of, uh, of performance optimization. And we were thinking like the engine will execute the, the query, mm -hmm. and we, were, we will have to format the query in a certain way to make sure that some kind of optimization will trigger and, and so on. But we were doing that because we were not able to access the engine. And, and this, this is this hierarchy of like, you have the language, you have the API, and you have the uh, information model. And we were trapped to this higher level where we were not able to access it. Right. So we will have to leak the abstraction on yeah. purpose. And maybe the problem with like leaky abstraction would be like, why, why are we trapped to, to only one level of abstraction at a time? And and we are we have to rely on on leaky abstraction um, levels to to be able to do what we want to do. Yeah, I uh, I, I, I that's a, a great question. Thank you. Um, I, the way I'm interpreting the question is kind of like uh, maybe sometimes encapsulation is too complete um, and it doesn't expose the information that we really need to have to do our job. Right. So. Um, 
sometimes when we build abstractions, we don't anticipate the way that people are going to end up using those abstractions, and we don't expose the right API into them, or we don't provide the right layer for people to access low-level information, right? Um, and in those cases, you have, you're sort of in the position of being forced to work around the abstraction, right? Like, all of us probably have a story about, you know, where we needed to get some piece of data that's locked away behind, you know, some iron curtain of, of code, and, you know, you're just gonna have to, by hook or by crook, try to pull it out of there somehow, because um, that's what you need to do to, to complete the task, right? Or implement the feature, or solve the problem, or whatever. Um, and, yeah, that's, I think that's a good point. Uh, I'm not totally sure that addresses your question, but that's kind of where I'm taking it. Is, is that kind of what you're thinking there? Is that the wavelength you're on? So, um, yeah, I, I think the, the, the problem of leaky abstraction is the, the problem with abstractions in general, like uh, to um, close the abstraction totally and, and make it not workable at, at the mm -hmm. end. Yeah. And then we have to, to take care of about the abstraction details. And it, I think the, it could be solved with extension points, but they are very difficult to define all the time and so on and so on. Right. So um, they have been worked on that to, to have like multi-layer abstraction and you can like dive into them and, and go up at the same time. Um, I think they have been worked uh, in compilers to be able to go back to the original source code mm -hmm. with comments, for example. Like s some people start to take care about the textual representation and to go back to it. Yeah. Um, and and this is a very new point of view. Before we we would think about text as a inferior representation and then we would dive directly to the AST and so on. Yeah. But now we are able to go back to the textual representation as well. Um, so so yeah. it is getting better, but yeah. yet. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the way that, uh, again, thanks for the follow-up. I, I think that, um, I think we are, as, as, a, as a discipline, as a, as a you know, uh, I don't want to use the word engineering, because I think Matt might completely destroy the idea that there's software engineering yesterday. Um, but just as, as, as people that work with code and, and programmers that are solving problems, uh, developers that are solving problems, um, you know, I do think that we're getting better at handling abstraction. I think that we are getting um, more capable of handling them successfully, uh, for sure. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm pleased by that. I'm pleased by that. And actually, uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about uh, in a few slides, I think, point toward that, because I didn't want this to just be like a lament, right? I didn't want it to just be sort of a, a, a eulogy for, for, for abstraction. Uh, there has to be, a, you know, there's a really super famous uh, paper called uh, Out of the Tar Pit, um, and it's super cool. It's, it's mostly pointing about distributed systems uh, design, um, and I wish that there was sort of a Out of the Tar Pit uh, paper or thought process around sort of design for abstraction. Um, and you know, I want it to be more in the vein of that, like, you know, trying to provide some kind of thought process around, you know, how can we make this better? So um, just to jump back into that a little bit. Um, so I guess what I wanted to do uh, now was, you know, sort of talking, after talking about um, superiority and sort of the decline of this civilization because of their terrible abstractions, um, I wanted to think about what is the cause of leaky abstractions? Like, what things cause us to leak out APIs or data or just um, operational details, right? Um, what are the things that um, influence uh, leaky abstractions such that they exist, right? Or that they're pervasive, right? So, question? Go ahead. Uh, uh, well, I guess I have one answer, which is it seems that when we neglect the expected memory and time efficiency of an operation mm -hmm. in our abstraction, mm -hmm then it becomes leaky. So the thing totally. that I always come back to is the Scala collections API mm -hmm. and how I can write something that I know I could implement with you know, jump instructions and incrementing uh, an index, but I end up getting something that does tons of allocation and takes like an order of magnitude longer than it should. All right. Yeah, uh, good, good point. Um, so one of the causes, uh, and, and, and this I think plays nicely into your comment, um, is that we abstract the, the wrong thing, right? Like, what does the quote wrong thing mean? Um, and I, I think there's sort of a variable meaning for what that is. Um, but 
a really, really good example is, for example, uh, you have a network interface, right? You have an API that calls out over the network, um, and you pretend somehow that that's like asynchronous, but actually it's a synchronous operation with the other side, or vice versa, right? Um, another thing that you can abstract that's wrong or not good is sort of latency, right? Like where you sort of uh, say, okay, well, this operation is going to take um, 50 milliseconds or something, uh, and then you just return it immediately, right? You return some value immediately. Um, and I know that there's like computational models where like futures, right, where things will get resolved in the future, um, and that's that's fantastic. Um, but I'm just thinking about like, you know, for everyday sort of web web API calls and other things that you might do on a remote basis to other nodes or whatever. Um, sometimes those abstractions can be really terrible, and they can really bite you, and they can really come back and haunt you. Um, and it could be you as the consumer of, of that abstraction, or it could be you as the, the you know the creator of the abstraction or, or your team. Um, the, another thing that is, uh, I think, a cause is sort of trying to abstract things that can't be abstracted. Um, like if you if you have complexity that's just complex, um, you know, sometimes you can't really build an abstraction on top of that that makes sense. Sometimes you have to, you, you just have to live with the complexity. Um, you can try to provide a, a nice interface into it. You can try to make it you know, sort of less cognitive load for the people that are following maintenance on, on your code or uh, trying to use your application, but sometimes you just have complexity and it's complex. Um, and that's just, just kind of how it is. Um, we, we sometimes run into the situation where we have things that are leaky by design, and I think this points back to uh, that tension, right, uh, sort of like what, what uh, Jonathan was saying earlier, between kind of like, um, the, the barrier between the data that's sort of in the underlying data model and sort of what you expose or let people consume. And there's a tension there, right? Like I said, so you're not always going to be able to anticipate how people use your abstractions. You're not always going to be able to, you know, figure out that, oh, well, I should have provided an interface to compute this derived value, or I should have um, exposed this data model, you know, this part of the data model directly to the user so that it could be modified very easily, um, you know? So I think uh, those are some of the things that really can lead to bad abstractions that end up being leaky, um, and things that are sharp, right? Things that cut you, things that you that you come back and you regret, <laughs> either using or 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 building. Um, that, that that regret can go both ways, right? Okay, so let us be honest with one another. One of the problems that a lot of us face, I think, is that. Um, Service providers, especially, and uh, software abstractions um, sort of promise us the moon, right? They're like, just build your application that, like you normally would, and it's just one giant computer, then you don't need to know all the details. Um, those, those things are sort of seductive, but not true, right? Uh, they, they, it's fine for you to ignore the details until it's not fine for you to ignore the details. and. Um, that's just that's just how things go sometimes. That's just how they work. You you have to be honest about what what the capabilities of your code are and what the capabilities of your abstraction are and what the limitations of your abstraction are. I think that's something that we sort of give short shrift to a lot of times. Um, you know, we we want to promote our we're, we're justifiably proud of the things that we that we make. I mean, that's just normal behavior, um, and we want to put it out there and maybe other people will find value in it, and that makes us happy because. You know, who, who doesn't like to be valued for their contributions? I think most people do. Um, but one of the things that we're not very honest about sometimes is, like, what are the limitations of the things that we're giving you? So it's like, okay, well, we built a database for you to use in your product, and, um, you know, it has this limitation and this limitation and this limitation, and sometimes we either gloss over or ignore those things, and uh, or we don't publicize them, right? Like, certainly if you're in a commercial software product, you're not going to publicize the things that you're the flaws that your abstraction has, um, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't pay anyone's uh, salary. So um, I guess what I'm asking for is a little more transparency, a little more honesty about sort of the limitations of some of these uh, systems and abstractions and programming languages and frameworks and all those sorts of things. Um, I think that would be really helpful. I, I mean, I'm not necessarily asking for like a bullet point list of all the things that are terrible, <laughs> right? But at least it would be nice to, to have a sense of what that is. Okay. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about tutorials and documentation. Can I ask before? Yeah, Can go I ahead. Ask? Thanks. Yeah. So it seems to me that you are basically blaming the authors of the attractions. Could it be that? Sorry. <laughs> Turn 
it in? Yeah. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So, do you think it could also, we can also blame the users? Yeah. Because sometimes when abstractions leak, it's Absolutely. just because they are used not in the right place. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a I'm a I'm a bear of little brain, so there's no there's no doubt in my mind that the mistakes and things that cut me on Spark are just because I'm dumb. Uh, I, I don't have any illusions about that at all, right? Like I'm just not experienced with the framework. But I guess what I'm what I'm trying to communicate and what I'm standing up here trying to communicate is that it's okay uh, for me to be dumb because I wish that there was more transparency about the things that I could be less dumb about, um, the things I need to be aware of as I build a Spark application or or, any, or build an X application in a framework. Um, you know. That, that, that sort of experience and wisdom, you know, comes with time, um, but it sure would short circuit a lot of like sort of groping around and failing and falling down on our faces if we just had more transparency about, um, you know, what were the limitations of certain things like when we're building our application, right? Because the promise is, well, you just build it. You just make it and it's one giant computer and that's how it works. But honestly, that's, that's not, <laughs> that's not how it works. The messy details get in the way. Right, things fail. Um, jobs uh, do stupid data partitioning. Right, like they'll try to move uh, 10 gigabytes over to this node that's already totally overloaded. Um, that happens all the time. You know, sch uh, scheduler goes crazy. It, it it fails. Whatever. There's all sorts of ways that the abstraction fails. Um, and I and what I just think would be really great is if there was more transparency about what things would fail and what failure modes they have. Um, I think that would be super valuable. Um, one of the other things that that I would like to encourage people to work on is tutorials and documentation, and not just like the same tutorial. Uh, one of the th one of the annoying things about Spark, in particular, is, uh, and I don't mean to pick on them. It's just that I had the most experience with this. If you want to count words with Spark, then there are literally 300 tutorials that will tell you how to do that. Um, if you want to do something real, like with real code, with real data. There's almost no tutorials that sort of describe what I'm trying to communicate, which is, you know, we have all these pain points, um, we have all these uh, leaky abstractions, and what are the things that leak? What are the things I need to care about? There's, there's almost nothing like that that I'm aware of. Uh, if you know, please, please let me know because I would, I would love to find that resource. Um, so tutorials and documentation can help, and I think that's a good way to communicate what are the sort of limitations that your system has, and you can draw that out in the tutorial. It could be like. Well, normally we would want to do X, Y, and Z, but you know, really, uh, if we try to implement Z, we're going to hit this roadblock and this roadblock, um, and we can overcome them in this certain way, right? But you know, this is an area where this framework is not that good. Um, so I just want to have people give thought to the way that people might use your abstraction. So both when you're building it and both when you consume it, right? What are all these pain points? And the the last thing I wanted to mention was. You need to give some thoughts to how people are going to operate your abstraction. So this goes above and beyond usage. This is really more about deployment. It's about configuration management. It's about monitoring. It's about metrics. It's about all the sort of things that um, you know a quote good production application is going to provide to your to your environment. Um, if you're in an environment where the where the software developers are responsible for the maintenance, right, for being on call for things, like if it fails or whatever. Um, those are the sorts of things that you need to provide uh, out of the box, right? And if, and if your abstraction makes it hard to operationalize your code base, then that's going to be another pain point. It's going to be another sharp edge that cuts you when you try to use this in production, right? Um, and um, that's, that's it. That's what I have to talk. Thanks. Oh yeah, microphone. Uh, cheers, a very interesting talk. I, I wonder whether a lot of the effort from some of the talks we've seen at Carry On is about what I might call synthetic abstraction, so like static analysis, mm -hmm. so not things that have necessarily been high level properties that the people have put in, but that someone's come along later and tried to examine and derive from it. Um, do you think that kind of approach of taking an existing artifact and kind of discovering properties of it is likely to be any more or less vulnerable to the, the leakage problem? Um, that's a great question. Uh, thanks. Um, that's actually a really interesting question, too. I, I think uh, the, the, one of the features that I like about the sort of static analysis pathways is that it does give you a signpost to some emergent behaviors that you might not even be aware of that it's in your system. 
um and i i think like ah jean's talk where she was ah discussing you know security policy is a perfect example of this sort of thing where you're gonna have policies about who can see what piece of data at what time um and you know the the myriad ways that 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 can conflict and come into and you know change over time like both the policy and who is looking at it um you know we we got to have tools that help us figure these things out and i think that with tools like static and analyzers and other things like that we can help understand what are the limitations of our abstraction right we can help um get a sense for okay well this is sort of the boundary of my abstraction so now maybe i can look at how people are interfacing with it and decide is this a really good boundary right like maybe it should be a little bit further out here a little bit further out there uh, maybe we should pull this part back right like no one uses that so um yeah great question thanks thanks Sure. I'm happy to go back to any of my slides. Uh, are using leaky abstractions all the time, for sure. example, uh, in natural language. Uh, and if, like you can say something, like all abstractions are leaky. Now, we didn't ask you to precisely define the word abstraction. Mm -hmm. Um, we didn't ex uh, ask you to give ex the exact temporal scope of R. I'm, I'm grateful, thank you. Yeah, um, but you know, we kind of know what you mean. It would maybe be nice if the uh, computer systems of the future didn't take us so literally. If uh, we could, as somebody else uh, suggested before, uh, throw a number of soft constraints at their behavior on mm -hmm. them and ask them to behave reasonably by keeping all those constraints in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks, it's a, it's a good, good comment. I appreciate that. Um, I, I think, Another way out of the tar pit uh, of, of abstraction might be uh, sort of along those lines, which is, you know, right now computers are super literal, and we really do have to anticipate all of the sorts of behaviors that users might uh, want to, to do with a system, right? We have to create how those interactions take place and what constraints they have. Um, in the future, maybe it can be more fuzzy, and that would be a lot better for everyone, right? Like, uh, if the computer was slightly more autonomous, um, that, that might be a good way to go, too. Uh, any other questions? No? No? One more? Okay. I was thinking that maybe we could have a notion of good and bad leaks. So um, if we have an abstraction which serves as a starting point where you have sort of a short specification you can understand, you can start writing your code quickly and get something running quickly. If then there's some kind of kind of incrementality property such that the extra details that you didn't want to know about at first, but you have to know about them in order to make the system work in all situations, mm -hmm. if you could enhance your system to take those extra conditions, those extra requirements into account, sort of incrementally, you, you don't have to refactor your whole system at the base. You could just add sort of a little bit of extra code. And if in that sense, if your leak allows you to start naively and then fix it up with a small amount of code, that's a good leak. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I, I do, I guess maybe I should have had a slide that says leaky not equal to bad. Um, I, I agree. I think if you can start small uh, and, and pretend, like one of the tactics that I like to use on a new project is like what is the stupidest thing that could possibly work, right? <laughs> like let's try that. It, maybe it'll work. Um, sometimes it doesn't because it's not fast enough or it's not performant enough or it doesn't have low enough latency or whatever. But you know, at least it's a point where you start with and yeah, you just work from there incrementally. Hopefully as you go forward, right, you're not, you're not buried under this mountain of technical debt um, and, and you can you know, continue on your merry way with your, with your abstraction enhanced over time. Yeah, good, good comment, thank you. There's also the kind of opposite problem, which I always find myself b bumping up against, which is uh, where there's no escape hatch, like uh -huh. th where the abstraction is actually successful. And you're like, well, if only I could reach over there and just change that other thing. Like if, it, if, if the design is like stratified and sometimes it makes sense to operate here and sometimes it makes sense to operate down here, yeah. when you actually can't dip below is yeah. actually incredibly frustrating. So I don't want things hermetically sealed all the time. Like, yeah. Uh, I, I agree with you. I, I think there there is definitely a tension uh, between layers of data, right? Like we need to be cognizant of that as both sort of implementers and consumers of that. Um, and it, and again, those are areas where I feel like documentation could really help you, right? It's like, oh, if you uh, you know use this method and you expect to get this piece of data out, 
it's not available, right? Like we've intentionally hidden from you, um, and maybe you could explain the rationale. Like I feel like we're missing so much of the why. <laughs> we're missing so much of the why, and I think that that's not a good thing. I, th I think I'd like to see more of that. And one more thing is like uh, free software allows you to, in theory, um, go as deep as down the stack as you want. So like everyone I'm, knows it's turtles. <laughs> But I kind of like that idea that, in principle, you could open up Spark and look at the code or whatever, whereas yeah. if you're using Redshift or something that you don't have true. access to, you're right. like, you can't go down. And, that's true. And um, you know, it probably isn't a bug in the kernel that's causing your issue, but like in yeah. theory, you can no, that's, respect that all the layers. Yeah, great great observation. Thanks. Um, so I, I think that's definitely true, and I, I maybe should have pointed it out. Like, a, a big difference between your own, your own on-premise abstraction and an abstraction as a service is, is that you don't control that other abstraction. You know, you're just, you just have this API. Whatever the API gives you, that's what you get. Um, and, you know, if you, if you want more than that, well, too bad. <laughs> you don't get it. Um, so, yeah, good point. Thank you. One more question? I'm going to go back to the cat picture because I really like it. There it is. Um, I, the last comment just made me think that uh, it seems that oftentimes the most transcendent wins you get as an engineer actually come from leaking your through your abstraction and changing something about what you're living on. So like, mm -hmm. if you just assume you have an x86 processor and you try to optimize things as much as you can, you only get so far. And then all of a sudden, Intel releases the Xeon Phi and mm -hmm. you have like 60 sub-processors sitting next to you. Right. Like there's a whole nother way of thinking, but you have to break your abstraction and go down a level. Yeah. And so, yeah, I don't know. And like the tensor processing unit from Google is another way where actually breaking the abstraction and going under it or like leaking through it and changing your assumptions actually makes it really a really powerful engineering idea. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's, that's another good comment. Thank you. Um, I totally agree with you. That can be really, really cool. Anyone else? No? All right, thank you very much for your time, and I uh, hope you enjoy your lunch. All right. <laughs>